afternoon. I now call to order. <laughs> Sorry, I now call my picture of me won't get out of the way. I now call to order the meeting of the curriculum committee for February 26, 2024. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Pumphrey. Ms. Booker Dwyer. I'm here. Present. Ms. Dominowski. Ms. Delosky. Present. Ms. Lichter. Present. Thank you. Ms. Cox, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. DiDonato. Present. Ms. Shea. Present. Dr. Wistead. Present. Ms. Myers. Present. Dr. Elmendorf. And we also have Ms. Fisher. Present. And I'm going to butcher this, Ms. Sinowski. Sinkowski, present. Thank you. Ms. Dingle. Present. Ms. Stansberry. Present. Dr. Kraft. Present. Dr. Wolf. And Ms. Wicks. No one else. Thank you. Thank you. Committee chairs will facilitate discussion by calling off names or committee members to speak in turn. Committee members will also acknowledge they have a question by calling on the chair, then saying their name. Staff members will answer any questions posed by committee members by saying their name first, then speaking. Staff members that want to add any discussion may call on the chair to speak, then saying their name. If the chair calls for any motions, the committee member will move and say their name, and a second committee member will second and say their name. The chair will then state, may a roll call member please, and um, assistants will speak each committee member for their vote and record appropriately for the ETA. Okay, thank you everybody. Here we are, I'm gonna get started since we um, are a couple minutes late. The first um, piece of new business on the agenda is the music studio spotlight on music. And I think we have Ms. Shea, Ms. Fisher, and Ms. Oh, I was trying to listen when you pronounced it. Stinkowski. Say it again. Stinkowski. Stinkowski. Okay. Ready to answer any questions. Dr. DiDonato, do you want to get started or staff? I will make up a time, make up time and jump right into turning this over to staff. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I will likewise follow suit. You heard from the um, recorded PowerPoint. That's a part of our flipped learning. This is an opportunity to um, do a contract extension for our core curricular resource for music at the elementary level. Um, I will turn it over to Ms. Sinkowski if there's anything specific she wants to share and then open it for questions. Sonia? Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so this is an opportunity to modify and um, extend a contract. So on the next slide, it just um, speaks to where when the contract initially was um, awarded and approved, which would be August 7th, 2018, and um, who it services, which is all of our students in grade K through five with the resources also being accessed for our pre-K students. And so um, that initial contract approval and spending authority is listed here on the slide. Um, the other piece that I wanted to call forward as we're just looking at the overview of this particular contract is um, highlighting a little bit of the usage data around um, the teachers who access and use Music Studio Spotlight on Music on a regular basis. Um, so Spotlight is assigned to teachers of record for all of our grades K through five vocal music courses. So that's every BCPS school and every BCPS student. And that's approximately 124 teacher accounts. Just today in BCPS, 31 teachers accessed and used Spotlight. It certainly would be something that they wouldn't have to access and use every day, but they could and would um, as the lesson calls for. 
And in the last seven days, um, out of the all of the teachers who log into McGraw Hill, approximately 60 of those teachers logged into Spotlight. So just a little bit of a snapshot of current usage. Um, it is a widely used and widely thought of resource for our elementary vocal music teachers. On the next slide, I will speak to why we need to uh, modify and extend this contract. Um, as Megan Shea mentioned, it is the core resource for the implementation of the BCPS vocal music curriculum. So the resource, which is a digital resource, provides all of the music accompaniments, um, authentic sounds, music from across the globe, anything that the teacher would be looking to access to supplement and have students singing on a regular basis for our vocal music courses in grades K through five. Um, as a product, why we like Music Studio Spotlight on Music, some of those re reasons are listed here on the slide. Certainly the correlation to state and national standards, which our teachers also noticed right away. Um, this is our first digital textbook for elementary vocal music. So prior there were, would be hard copy teacher editions and student editions, but now we have a, a lot more um, digital resources and accessible resources in this platform, which opens us up to even more um, diverse uh, music examples and samples and full recordings from across um, the curriculum. Teachers notice that um, they say it reflects a global view of music education and reflects our population diversity, which is a very important. The text and materials as a digital resource were also found to be customizable, intuitive and searchable, which really helps for um, streamlining the planning process for our teachers on the day to day basis. And we know having high quality music supports that lifelong appreciation of music, which we hope to expose students to in their vocal music elementary um, time. So those are some of the reasons why. Another reason that we wanted to mention a uh, why do we need it is we're also looking at our current landscape of um, conditional teachers that are coming into BCPS and we want to ensure that we set teachers up for success, particularly those that are working towards that certification piece in the first few years. Um, and we find that having high quality resources helps those teachers to be successful in those um, placements. There are certainly a wide range of skills related to being a music teacher in an elementary school, and some come in very specialized in one instrument, and some have additional piano skills that they can add to that piece. But it is not the expectation of that an undergraduate education would lead every music teacher to be an amazing accompanist or a pianist. So having digital resources is critical. All right, moving to our next slide, which talks a little bit about how we currently implement it and how we will continue to implement it if the contract modification is approved. So students and teachers will continue to have digital access, single sign on through the learning management system. Um, as I may have mentioned, it's rostered at the course level. So any teacher who is teaching vocal music has access and any student who's enrolled in vocal music has access. Um, for the modification process, the Department of Enterprise Solutions has completed a software review for the integration to ensure that we have student privacy and safety um, acknowledged. And we will continue as an office to manage subscriptions and analyze any user data that we can using McGraw-Hill's platform and um, any self-reported data that we're able to collect. We did include the cost per pupil on this slide, um, just as um, we're looking across all of the students that are enrolled in the courses that have access to Spotlight on Music. And then um, also while we're thinking about how it will be implemented, we also wanted to point out what happens if it is not available for teachers. Um, if we are not able to extend the contract um, for the next few years, we know that teachers will lose out on access to those high quality resources, which will um, uh, not be a detriment to our uh, vocal music classes. We will then have to supplement with free and available copyright royalty free resources, which are limited to be able to have those available for our students. And that would take significant work over the summer to align resources to the curriculum in the way that Spotlight on Music is already aligned and those resources are already identified. Um, we also anticipate some teacher um, impressions that they may, may feel ill-equipped to complete their job responsibilities without having an identified digital textbook. 
All right. Our next slide talks a little bit about the evaluation, and then um, from there we can turn it over to any questions. Um, so we'll continue to uh, measure through course performance. How do our students do in vocal music? But we also um, know that this is a resource that helps to focus on academic achievement based on the literacy skills that are um, embedded into the resource and that are appropriate for each grade level. So that will help us in implementing the aligned written and taught assessed curriculum since it is directly um, correlated and aligned to spotlight. We mentioned that it has that alignment to state standards um, with that emphasis on literacy, numeracy, and writing, um, which is a part of our teaching and learning framework here in BCPS. Um, our most recent training with our teachers this fall focused on the ways that Spotlight helps to demonstrate culturally responsive teaching. So we took a look at the resources that are available for our English language learners and the ways that um, globally available resources are in Spotlight. And that was a very well received professional learning um, as we continue to pr provide pieces of Spotlight and um, ongoing training for our teachers in using the resource. All right, I don't um, before we turn it over to any questions, I was going to just see if um, Sherry Fisher, our director, has anything to add related to the use of Spotlight or um, where we're at with that resource. I think you did a great job, Sonia, so open thank up you. questions. Wonderful. All right, the last slide is just our thank you for this time and for your consideration and if there are any questions. So um, thank you for that. Um, board members, do you have any questions about Spotlight? on music, I think that's my track. Any questions? No questions. My only question is when does the contract expire? August. It would yeah, oh, it would expire at the end of the year. Megan's right. Yep, end of the school year. At the end of the school year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um any other questions? Okay. Hearing none. Um may I have a motion to approve the contract for music studio spotlight on music. So moves to Lusky. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Booker DeWire. Thank you. Ms. Cox, roll call vote, please. Ms. Pumphrey. Ms. Booker DeWire. Yes. Ms. Dominowski. Ms. Delosky. Yes. Ms. Lichter. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The contract passes to the contract committee. Thank you for that. Um, next on the agenda is the pre-kindergarten instructional materials. And for that, we have Dr. Wisted and Ms. Stingle. Hi there. Um, I'm going to start out and just do an intro because I know you heard the recording. And um, for some of you that were on the committee last year, you heard this go through last year. So we're asking for an increase. Um, in the contract, because as you are aware, we have expanded um, more uh, rapidly than expected with our full day preschool and pre kindergarten sessions. And as a result, we need to increase spending authority for the curriculum. So, with that, I don't know if there's a particular slide you want me to go to or if you just have questions about it. Um, I think we can go to questions um, and then you can identify slides if you think we need them. Um, board members, questions? Yes, I have a question. And so my question is, um, so with the projections, what what's contributed to the increase in the, is it is it that we have more students qualifying? Is it that we open more centers? What's we, contributing we, to the increase? Oh, go ahead, Melissa, you want to go? OK, so um, <laughs> Ms. Booker Dreyer, uh, yes, we have more. We do have more students that qualify that we need to find seeds for, and we've uh, made a very concerted effort in order to expand to provide um, that full day pre-kindergarten option for as many students as possible. So this was a very deliberate effort um, working with strategic planning, facilities, um, the various other offices, our partners, um, in uh, the fine arts and so that we really could try to move those forward. Um, so this is just an accelerated um, movement on the plan to offer more full day pre-K options to our students. 
And are we offering these options to some of the private child care providers? Like, wh where are we with the partnership with partnering with private child care providers? And um, are we also providing them with curriculum? So, so we are. Um, oh, go ahead, Melissa. You can go ahead. Or Lisa, go ahead. I was going to say it's a wonderful question. Um, we do have we have partnerships right now with six private providers. Uh, we had three last year, so we are making growth in that area. Obviously, we need to do a lot more in order to have seats for all of the children that Melissa D uh, shared um, will qualify with the blueprint now up to 300 percent of the federal poverty level. Uh, students do qualify. Um, we do partnership right now with uh, providing professional development, assisting them in grant writing, helping them manage their grants. We make recommendations for curriculum, but we don't have that authority to tell them what curriculum to use. Um, and so many of the PD opportunities that we provide in Baltimore County um, regarding our Connect for Learning curriculum, they've been invited to because we've embedded best practices in that. Um, but we cannot necessarily uh, tell them what curriculum they must use. And we wouldn't be spending on this contract to give them a curriculum if that is, was part of the question as far as why the spending authority would have to increase. Okay, no. Okay, so that's good to know. Now, thank you for that clarification. And then my last question around the pre-K instructional material. So traditionally, principals are not trained on pre-K. Um, it's typically, you know, starts at K. And so with these instructional materials and the um, and, you know, expanding them and doing more with pre-K, is there uh, specific training for principals and what they should observe so that it's, you know, it's not like a kindergarten classroom. Pre-K really is something, a, a totally different learning experience. You're absolutely right with that. Last year for the new full day programs, principals had an opportunity to participate in the training for Connect for Learning. Uh, this year, we continue to focus heavily on teachers, but we will be providing training for all principals uh, and assistant principals in April. So we're doing uh, four sessions over two days and uh, it should be a required training. We're hoping that everyone attends. We're really trying to get the messaging out that it is critically important that they attend these trainings. Again, like um, last year, those principals who were transitioning to full day, they did have access to the training. Uh, but this year, we want to make sure that all principals have it in preparation for next year. And you are absolutely correct in saying that pre-K and preschool, it is completely different than kindergarten and first grade. So the training that we provide to them needs to be unique to the needs of the students and best practices that are in alignment, in alignment with uh, the students that we're servicing. Thank you so much, Ms. Dingle. I know you're on it. Thanks. <laughs> Trying to. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I have um, two questions. One, um, you referred to it as a new curriculum in the PowerPoint, but this, the programs that currently have full day, these are the materials they're using, correct? Correct. Okay. And so um, all programs, in the beginning, we were offering the, prog uh, the Connect for Learning just for those programs that were in full day. Um, as we uh, recognized that we had staff in our office, we did training for all teachers in the beginning of the school year and highly encouraged them to join Connect for Learning. And quite frankly, the curriculum sold itself. Um, number one, we did the training. We had a week long uh, PD opportunity for our pre-K teachers, our special educators and our peer educators. And all but 10 schools decided to go into the new curriculum. So that was really, really exciting. Beginning quarter four, we're transitioning those 10 schools into Connect for Learning. Learning, so that at the beginning of next year, all schools, regardless of half day, full day, uh, threes or fours, will be using Connect for Learning. So, so how many years have we used it? Like this year's the first year. Okay. Do we have any feedback? We did a pilot the the year Correct. before. before. Okay. So, do we have any feedback from teachers as far as implementation and, and their thoughts about it? Yeah, we took a lot of feedback during the pilot, to be honest with you. Um, a lot of the feedback was more about the transition to the new curriculum. We find that we're getting that feedback as well. Change is hard. Um, but overwhelmingly, the teachers enjoy the curriculum. We did add components that was feedback from the pilot of Hagerty into the curriculum, and the teachers are really giving us positive feedback around that. 
Um, they are also talking about scheduling for full day and how they can do more components of the curriculum clearly um, that now that they have a full day versus those half days. So we've been working with half day programs and adjusting the curriculum to meet the needs of a half day program. Um, and what we're also doing to support those uh, regional programs as well. But overwhelmingly, the teachers are enjoying it and we're seeing um, that we're starting to collect data to see how efficient or the effectiveness of the curriculum is as well. Which leads to my next question. Can we put up the data slide, the slide that you had? Um, I'm not sure which number it was. It's towards the end. Uh, Jim, it's yeah. maybe I like want to say like seven, slide five, six, yeah, six, yeah. seven, eight are the yeah. data slides. Um, so we so keep going. So okay, right, if you start right there. Slide, so there. those slides. So mm -hmm. when um, it's talking about students' demonstrated growth, what is how are you judging demonstrated growth? Is that going from yellow to red or red to blue, or are you looking at um, a different way? How's that defined? Right. So with the ELA, there are levels of progression. And so the ELA, you can go from level one, which is approximately three years of age, all the way up to level five, which is the end of kindergarten. And they even have like developmental levels that precede level one. And so what we're looking at in that data are students that are demonstrating growth, um, whether they, some of them may have stayed in the same range, but within that range they've de demonstrated growth, or in some cases they've moved to an additional level. Okay, so then demonstrated growth would be equal to moving a level. Right, so demonstrating means that typically there are four or five, which for demonstrating um, proficiency means that they are um, either approximate entry to kindergarten or the end of kindergarten. But we have in this chart, these are the students who are demonstrated growth. So they may not be at level four or five yet because that's towards the end of the school year. But from the fall administration and to the winter administration, they have demonstrated growth. So they may be in level two, but a higher place in level two, or they may have gone from level two to level three, but they have all demonstrated some measure of growth from the fall to the winter. Okay, so sometimes we say there's growth and then if you look deeper, they may have, it's not signif statistically significant growth. So I was just trying to figure out how that was being defined, but it it still could be very small. And, so and we are- I, Sorry, go ahead. Please. No, no, go right ahead, Melissa D. Um, since this is the first year of using the curriculum and administering this assessment, we are working with DRAA. Um, to help analyze the data to get it in another system. Right now it gets um, uploaded into the K-Ready system, the same system that we use for the KRA. Um, so pulling it back out and putting it in a discernible format where we can really look at some of those other metrics. So the by student groups and by students who might be identified as um, mm -hmm. potential multilingual learners, um, that is something we're working with DRAA to be able to do that because they have to pull the data back out of the system and match it with student IDs. But for the demonstrating growth, it's really demonstrating growth between the levels. So if you look at the um, uppercase letters in pre-K, fall 24.9% uh, of students were at the emerging level, and now um, only 10% of students are. So that's a growth of 14.9% of students moved to like the next level of proficiency. And so when we're looking at growth, we're really looking at how are they moving from one band of achievement to the next. Okay, it just kind of looks a little bit that the bubbles aren't exactly aligned to the, the scale. So what you just described was kids moving from one range to another range, but that wouldn't be 62%. So you, you have two different if I understand it right, you have two different measures on the slide. True. The 62% yes. isn't moving from one range to the next. That's right. Based on what Ms. Dingle said, it could be they moved levels or just made any kind of movement within the assessment. And so why don't we get, oh, go right ahead. Why don't we get clarification on that for you so that we have uh, even more specific data so that it's clear? Because I agree, I see what you're saying with that. No, I like 62% growth. Don't get me don't get me wrong. I'm just trying to figure out what that, you know, is based Absolutely. on. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions from Ms. Dolesky or Ms. Booker Dwyer? 
Okay. Thank you. Then um, do I have a motion to approve the pre kindergarten instructional materials contract? So moves to Lusky. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Booker DeWire. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Cox? Ms. Booker DeWire? Yes. Ms. Delosky? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the contract will proceed to the Contracts Committee. Third on the agenda is the Tutorfly contract. Um, and for that, we have Mr. Mustafer, Ms. Shea, and Ms. Stansberry. Mr. Mustafer wasn't able to join us, so it's going to be um, Ms. Shea and Ms. Stansberry. Okay, yes, thank so you. I will um, jump in just to get us started. Um, so as you heard from the presentation, this is a contract that's coming forward, um, leveraging the strategy around in-school day tutoring. So this is specific to our um, CSI and ATSI schools, specifically writing into their plans for support um, to utilize the school day tutoring. Um, and so as a result of being identified as a CSI or ATSI school, um, and Ms. Stansbury has talked with this group before that uh, part of what these schools need to do is they are charged with creating a needs assessment and developing a school progress plan to specifically talk about instructional transformation. And so this is one of our evidence based strategies that these schools have chosen. Um, and so the contract is really um, to allow a um, vendor, Tutorfly in this case, to support us with the hiring of these tutors. That is a challenge. And so when individual schools have to take that on themselves, that can create um, quite a lift for schools who we need focused on students and uh, teachers in the classroom. Um, and so in the presentation, we outlined how the different schools are working together both with their support team that Mr. Mustafer leads um, in the support for school improvement, but also with um, Michelle Stansberry's team and with my academic teams um, to develop their plans of implementation. Um, so we are here just to answer any questions you might have, but the purpose of the contract is to allow the schools to engage with this vendor to get some high dosage in school day tutoring started to support our students specifically in math for this year. Ms. Stansberry, anything you want to add before we open it to questions? Um, no, just that the well, yes, I guess just that the funding <laughs> is coming out of the school improvement grant um, through MSDE, and that the focus is specifically on the CSI and ATSI schools. Thank you. Questions from board members? I have some questions. So the scheduling um, on slide five this implementation plan. So it's occurring during the school day. Yes. During advisory, what typically occurs during advisory that students in tutoring will miss? So there's a wide range of how the schools. So you um, saw on the plan that of the six schools, they're all um, planning to use different time periods. So some of the schools identified advisory. That's currently a time sometimes is used for um, things like um, school wide SEL um, plans. It also could be used for just extra time for kids to connect with teachers or to have opportunities for um, coach class. Um, in, so, in some instances, the advisory period is more like a homeroom where they are um, checking in, doing attendance, handling those types of things. So um, we talked about that to make sure that this is not, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul. So what would the plan be for how students, if they are going to utilize the advisory period? Um, because the tutoring only happens um, as a minimum of 60 to 90 minutes per week, the schools that identified the advisory period talked about that usually there's a blend of like whole class instruction. So some of those um, character ed pieces or some of those SEL lessons, that would be the part that the students still participated in. And then some of those advisory periods that were more flexible where students utilized it to check in with teachers, pull up their grades in Schoology and monitor some of that that would be the time that students participated in the tutoring. So we talked about making sure that um, there was a blend. Um, same thing, the priority and what you'll see there in terms of the implementation plan and some of the um, options is really because this is happening in the third and fourth marking period where schedules are set. Um, so this is an opportunity for schools to 
be responsive to what do we have currently and then how might that adjust moving forward based on the feedback. But what was uh, a non-negotiable, which is some of the mistakes that we have made in the past, and I mean the royal we in education, is that it cannot happen during math class. Um, so other times models of tutoring, um, we took students away from uh, that high quality first instruction to provide this. And the intent here was to say to principals, there's some flexibility around what you already have in your building and what you're able to reallocate in terms of time for students. But the non-negotiable was that it had to be in addition to that high quality math instruction they were getting in their class. So that's why you see some flexible opportunities there. Right, because I mean, even with the elective courses, then we're talking about, you know, our arts and music that, you know, students will miss time from. And my my only concern with this model is that if you have a student who already doesn't like math, who where this elective time or this advisory period may be the, the hook that's keeping them engaged in school. And now we're taking that away from them, even yeah. if it is just for 60 to 90 minutes per week, um, that could truly impact how a student um, view school Views because for them. some yep. students those elective courses are the hook that's keeping them engaged and now you just put math which I don't like um, in you know an additional dosage of math so I'm just wondering is there a more innovative way or as we're thinking about schedules in the future could, it, could we purposefully build kind of an intervention block into all student schedules so that they don't so that a student who may need more support doesn't feel like they're missing something. And oftentimes it's art, it's music, or it's, um, you know, the, like you said, during that advisory period, also know that's when a lot of career conversations are happening mm -hmm. and all of that. So that it's important things that they're missing out on. Um, and so I get it, we're adding it in now, um, but looking forward to scheduling at that middle school level, are we thinking about building in that intervention block? Because really, all of our middle All school kids. students <laughs> need an extra dosage of math. Yes, so Ms. Booker Dwyer, first you should know that you are speaking my language with Pillar 3's problem of practice because our Blueprint Pillar teams, this is our problem of practice, is how we create those um, structures so that we're not choosing. I do want to make two points of clarification. The elective course will not be art, music, or CTE. Specifically, two of our middle schools are currently running the Effective Learning Habits elective course, which is a course based on developing students um, executive functioning and study skills and offers tutoring. And then the other elective course is some of our schools offer AVID tutorials in which students participate in peer tutoring. So those are the only two elective courses where students are already engaging in some type of this work. So I want to make that abundantly clear, first of all, so I don't hear from my art and music folks as well, um, but also because you're right, that is sometimes that's the reason kids go to school and we want to preserve that. So I did want to clarify that piece. But Thank to you, your yeah. point, some of this is we need a strategy for how all students can have time built in that they're not missing something else. We know that this is going to be a part of our strategy moving forward. Part of what we're hoping to do with the schools this year is figure out if it is advisory time, then how do we design that built in for all middle schools moving forward so that this is something that's built into the schedule um, and not something that we have to um, worry about students feeling like they're being pulled out. Um, and I, I also want to offer that math identity is a critical piece to how we're selecting some of the students um, because we do not want to reinforce negative beliefs about getting additional support for math. Um, and so pulling them out of even lunch with their friends, you know, all of these things, really negotiating with students and relying on schools who know their schedules and know their students to, to figure out what is that opportune time for this semester and then using some of that feedback to be able to make recommendations moving forward long term. That's helpful. And then my other question is, who are these tutor fly tutors? So you mean who do they recruit? Or like who 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 will be the tutors that are coming into the school? What are what is that? What are their backgrounds? I mean, are these college kids? Are they high school students? Are they people on the teaching pathway? Like. Who's yeah, coming so, into our school to tutor our kids? 
So I will offer D all of the above. The Tudor Fly contract, and I will rely on Miss Dansbury, but I will double check that I'm not confusing it with, um, I want to make sure I'm not confusing it with my math tutoring grant. Primarily, these are not high school students. Tutor Fly employs, um, some may be college or grad students, and some may be part-time teachers. Some might be career changers that have decided that they want to work with students. When we met with the representatives from Tutor Fly, they gave us several different profiles. Um, they have a pretty rigorous um, vetting process of how they choose their tutors um, based on their application process and based on then the ongoing evaluation. Um, but I will look to Ms. Stansbury to confirm. My recollection is it was not high school students, but they did um, in some cases have um, at least grad students, but I'll have to check on college students. Ms. Stansbury, you do you correct. recall? Yeah, oh, okay. So if these are our most our students who are being are challenged the most and we're putting tutors in front of them who may not be trained in the pedagogy or how to effectively engage or manage. You know, I'm, I get we have a teacher shortage, especially in math, but these are the students who need teachers, um, who need people who truly understand the curriculum and how to work with students who are who are behind. Um, and so I'm just wondering. Is two to fly the right way to go, or is it worthwhile trying to invest in in a different approach? So I'll go first, but I'll certainly welcome Ms. Stansberry or anyone else. I think there's a couple of things. One is remember that this is not instead of having that expert teacher and, and high quality instruction. This is that second piece. The piece that you referenced about training, we agree. We had several meetings already with TutorFly about what is the training that tutors get just around tutoring and working with middle school students, and what is the training we are going to provide through our CSI specialists in math that will work specifically with these tutors to train them in illustrative math and to also train them in our curricular resource. So they will get double training, both from TutorFly and then also with us um, to support our students. The other piece that I want to put in this space is that um, MSDE in particular, um, whether it's through the Maryland Leeds grant or with Blueprint, they've been providing additional resources about this high leverage strategy of in school day tutoring. And some of the research talks about one of the critical deciders is really about the relationship that kids form with the tutor and oftentimes younger tutors who um, the students connect with and are able to form that relationship, whether they're newly out of college students or students um, can identify with that new career pathway with some, with some grad students. Um, that actually is um, a value add in for a middle school student in terms of wanting to spend time. So one of the first things that we try to do in a tutoring and some of the research supports is that it's actually critically important that this is someone students like and that they want to spend time with and build that relationship with. Um, you'll get no argument from me that in addition to tutoring, we need to continue to invest in more math time for instruction. So I know we're having conversations about schedules at the middle school level and how do we make sure we increase the amount of math instruction that students are getting. Um, and my hope is that it becomes a both and and not an either or that this really truly becomes a supplement. Um, but Ms. Stansberry or Dr. DiDonato, I want to open it if there's anything you want to add to that piece? I just wanted to add one small piece that there are other approaches outside of this that occur outside of the school day, as well as looking at the integration of math and ELA and reading concepts in some out of school time programs that can embed those activities with something that's very engaging and enduring for students. So when I think about um, cooking club and how they're embedding those strategies outside of the school day in the cooking club. And many times those um, activities are facilitated by our BCPS teachers. So they're reinforcing the things that they've taught during the day out, outside of the school day with activities that kids are, are really engaged and involved in and sometimes are selecting what is of interest to them. So this is one of many um, approaches that we are attempting to, to use to really get kids to where they need to be. Dr. Diodonato, did you want to add? Sure, and I think Ms. Booker-Dreyer, even to your point of, you know, is this the best option for students? I think part of doing that is to implement it and collect data to see, do we see a difference with our students? Are we seeing them make more progress? Are we seeing them maybe because of um, 
the excitement about meeting with the tutor, maybe their attendance improves because they want to be at school on that day to meet with that cool individual who might be working with them. Um, and do we see just their um, engagement then in their math classes maybe improve because they are making some incremental progress? So I, I do think this is not a, you know, this is where we're going forever. I think this is one high impact strategy that's been identified, it's been researched, and we're gonna, we would like to implement it to see what results we are able to yield with it, um, and then determine if the, this is something that we move forward with, um, you know, to additional schools. Thank you. Ms. Lecture, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Teleski, do you have any questions? Just one quick question. Thank you for the presentation about the assessment process. So I think it's great that you're going to look at attendance and academic data. Would that take place at the end of this school year? And then what components would be part of that? So there's a couple things. So um, we actually could talk in terms of cycles of tutoring. So typically like an eight week um, cycle. So this year, because of when we're bringing it in, it would coincide with the end of the year. But typically with a tutoring program, you don't want to wait that long. You want to actually be checking in and monitoring progress around those um, shorter cycles of tutoring. Um, we they we will start with a pre and post assessment just of general math um, skills, but then we will also be looking at the curricular unit assessments that occur within that um, cycle of tutoring. So we'll do both. We'll look at the pre and post assessment and by pre and post, I mean within that tutoring cycle, which hopefully, I, don't, I mean, at, at, by the time we get this rolling, it'll probably be one eight week cycle, I hope. Um, and then um, also looking at the curriculum based assessment units that happen within that cycle, which varies by course um, based on the pacing of the curriculum. And then would there be um, feedback from individual students where Absolutely. they would be more of an open ended? Yeah, so there's a couple things we want to get. Um, absolutely, student feedback is a part of this um, for two reasons. One is um, we want to know for the students if it's helping them <laughs> and if they engage in it, but also getting feedback about some of the choices we talked about. So some of the structural pieces. Um, so how is it helping you with math, but also how is it helping you to develop those um, learning habits and some of the structural choices? So if a school puts it in because we have some decisions to make to Dr. DiDonato's point, we want to gather data on both the implementation and the mathematics, right? So we want to look at both. Um, our middle school students, all of our students, but middle school students in particular, um, often have a lot to share and their feedback is really critical on the success because if this is something that they feel is helping them, then they're going to be more eager. Their attendance hopefully will be more consistent. Um, we also talked about having feedback from the um, school leadership teams and department chairs about how we're choosing students um, and whether or not we're using the right metrics to identify who would be a good fit for this approach. Because as Ms. Stansbury shared, there's multiple things going on. These are schools that are working um, really, really hard around school transformation and about all the different ways they want to engage in this work. And so this is just one piece. So the student input, um, as well as feedback, we mentioned that one way students may be identified is through parent. And that's really as a result of if you're having a team meeting and a parent references that this is something that they would find value because we know if they have that wraparound support, someone at home is saying this is a great thing that you were selected. The difference between, you know, I've been selected to participate in something versus now I got to go for more math help to Miss Booker Dwyer's um, point earlier is really impactful, especially for the adolescent learner. Um, so we want them to have some agency around what feels helpful, but also engaging with some of the choices of the how we're implementing it because they can give us feedback on what's a better way to support them. Thank you. Sure. Um, my question is um, the tutor fly is only getting the tutors like that's their only role, correct? Like we do the PD and it's illustrative maths 
um, tutoring so, program. So TutorFly is charged with hiring and monitoring the performance of their tutors. So they actually mm -hmm. run the program. So they evaluate their employees. They do training with their employees as well. We are doing additional training because we want TutorFly. So if we did not have the IM curriculum, when TutorFly engages with some partners, they get to decide the curriculum. They get to decide the, the content. We have decided in BCPS that we want the tutoring to be aligned to illustrative math. So TutorFly still hires, trains, and monitors the implementation of the tutors. We're providing additional professional learning around illustrative math specifically, um, and along with our curriculum-based assessment so that the tutors are working directly with um, our curriculum piece. Okay, thank you for that. And with the illustrative math, is there a separate tutoring component for that program or it came with the program or you're figuring out a way to take the materials and make it a tutoring program? A, B, or C? So, <laughs> actually, D, TutorFly oh. is charged with doing that piece. So, okay. right, so they actually have to do the planning. I'm, we're not planning their tutoring engagements for them. We're training them in the illustrative math. We're giving them access to the curricular resource and to our scope and sequence so they know precisely which standards are coming up in the unit. But they're actually paid to plan, and that's a part of what TutorFly trains and supports them on. Okay, so then what is our role in monitoring TutorFly? So I know TutorFly is monitoring the tutors, but because so much of it is aligned to what we are already doing, what is our role with monitoring them? Yeah, it's a great question. So there's two pieces. Ms. Dansbury, please cut me off if you would rather answer first. I just got on the phone, so great. please. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I was like, please. I'm backing you or up. Dr. DiGnato, if anybody else wants to go first, but um a couple things. One is um, certainly our schools, we have an expectation, not that they are assigning staff members, because if to Ms. Booker Dwyer's point, if we had extra teachers to do this, we would already be doing that. Um, but there is a constant engagement with a point of contact at the school, and that's in terms of monitoring implementation. So are the tutors showing up on time? Are the tutors um, planned? Are the tutors, you know, is it actually being implemented the way the contract is outlined? Um, so we have structures that we have initiated with schools, but certainly pending the outcome of the contract would um, follow up with schools about how are we monitoring just from the level of implementation. So the contract says you're going to provide this many tutors, they're going to be here at this time, they're going to be using these materials. So we have that evaluation piece. Um, but then we're also monitoring the impact of whether or not it's actually changing outcomes for kids and having that be a part of our ongoing relationship with TutorFly. So if we have hired you to do this piece, part of those outcomes needs to be shifting, you know, student achievement. So that's also a part of that evaluation. So there's sort of implementation evaluation, but then also effectiveness um, of the impact for students, because of course, Hopefully they're also getting high quality instruction in their math class. So if their curriculum based assessments increase, we can't say it was specifically just tutor fly. We're hoping that it's a combination of factors. OK, thank you for that. Um, any last questions before we move I, on? I have one additional question. Don't we already have a tutoring service for math? So, so we there have our. Oh, I had to use matter. No, please. There are several approved contracts. However, there are bandwidth uh, staff limitations with some of the agencies that we're already using. So this allows another um, organization to provide tutors. So for example, I it might even just been our last meeting. Um, we had the math tutoring grant, but that's specifically with UMBC. And so, so that is a finite parameter of who we're partnering with that. So there are other, um, tutoring, um, especially with our Title I schools and with COP for extended um, learning opportunities, there are other tutoring contracts. However, this allows for a, another organization group who has um, a, a track record of having a, more tutors available. So that is my concern. I feel like it, there are so many cooks in the kitchen um, when it comes to this and that we need a strategic aligned approach and keep bringing on a vendor to address this student need when I'm not even sure we've seen the data of effectiveness for the other tutors we have in the uh, school system to know that that's even working. And now we want to bring on yet another group of tutors who are not yet trained in our math curriculum. So they're going to be tutoring while they're being trained. I just I, I don't I have an issue with that. It just feels like there's money that needs to be spent. And so we're going to spend it on on tutoring, which is a, a 
a high impact strategy, but I just feel like this approach, I, I just, I, I can't see supporting bringing yet another math vendor into the school system when we don't even know if the vendors we're working with are working well, and if that's something that we need to expand. Or is, you know, I, it, so yeah, I just, I, I don't feel comfortable approving this um, for, for those reasons. I just feel like we need to get really clear on what's the effective tutoring strategies that we're going with in Baltimore County, who are we going to use and really go deep with, how are we going to ensure that we're not pulling students out of other sections? How are we strategically building schedules? Like it just needs to be, a, I feel like a more strategic approach to this instead of keep bringing on vendors to for tutoring when I'm not even sure it's working um, in Baltimore County right now. So thank you for that, Ms. Booker. May I share one thing and then I, and I appreciate you. You always um, keep it real with with your perspectives and your concerns. And, and I understand that I want to offer a couple of things. Um, we do not we are not currently other than so the math tutoring grant from MSTE has not started. So that is a very specific project with UMBC. And the purpose of that project is about helping us as a district build an infrastructure to run our own tutoring in BCPS. So it's a little bit nuanced. Of course, we do that through tutoring children, but the purpose of that grant was to provide seed money for Baltimore County Public Schools to learn how to have our own tutoring infrastructures. To your point, to have that strategic approach to build an infrastructure. And that grant required us to partner with an Institute of Higher Education so that we could pay piggyback off of their infrastructure and learn from them how to do that. That is going to be at one school. That's all the capacity that they could take on because again, the focus is teaching us how to stand up our own infrastructure to support tutoring. We are not currently, and Ms. Stansberry can correct me if I'm wrong, there are not other schools right now that are working with vendors to provide in-school day math tutoring. That is not currently happening. What Dr. Dean and I referenced- it's, it's happening at my kid's middle school. I do remember that because the, my kids were signed up for it. So that's the only reason why I'm saying I don't even know. With another vendor? Yes, that is my understanding. Now, have they participated in it? No, they have not. Um, <laughs> but it is on their schedule. We got all the correspondences as parents. So, so that's what my confusion is I hear around you. this tutoring. Yeah, and that's that's really good feedback, and we can certainly follow up on that. What I was just going to reference is the prior contracts that we had in place. Oftentimes what would happen is they would max capacity, and so we would try to bring on another school, or schools would contact vendors and be told, we don't have any more tutors, we can't help you. And so while I appreciate your idea about having a cohesive strategy, I would offer probably any strategy we have is going to have to allow for multiple vendors just to keep up with demand because this is a high leverage strategy. It's one that every other LEA in the state has on their list as things that they're pursuing. And so some of the other feedback we've gotten is that um, yes, there are other vendors that have been improved contractually, but then when you call them as a school principal or you try to reach out and say, I want to offer this at my school, oftentimes the feedback we were getting from schools is they say, we can't do it because we've reached max capacity with who we're able to hire. So I was just offering that even long term, um, and I appreciate your feedback. I certainly will check into that one um, with the one that you described um, and certainly will defer to um, Ms. Stansberry, but I was referencing that I think any cohesive strategy that we have is going to have to require multiple vendors. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention about TutorFly is they already have tutors that have been trained, so they hire a robust staff. That's what they do. Their full-time job is recruiting, training, and supporting tutors. What would be the additional new training is um, us supporting that we want them using IM. And the reason that we are being so specific about that, as you well know from other presentations, is that IM is a different philosophical shift for mathematics instruction. It is about a problem-based curriculum. It's about mathematical reasoning. It's about having students engage in mathematical discourse. We did not want our students to go to a very different approach during this tutoring program and learn sort of these memorized formulas that are not conducive to the type of thinking we're trying to teach. But I want to be clear that these are not people that are like hired off the street on a Tuesday and we're sitting them in front of kids. TutorFly has a really robust um, platform for how they onboard. Um, but I appreciate your feedback around not wanting to feel like we're just trying to spend money. Um, this is a high leverage strategy that does have a really good research base. Um, 
And that is something that we don't have a long line of to support our principals when they go in school transformation. So when we can identify one that we know has an evidence base, um, we're looking to try to get some some you know time for kids to to see how this works. Um, but so I just wanted to offer that clarification of that piece. But I certainly do want to follow up with your your child's middle school to find out what that is. So thank you for that. Um, to piggyback a little bit on what Ms. Booker Dwyer said, what how what is our out with Tutor Fly? Like, is it a whole year commitment? No matter what, is it month by month? What is what what are what's the contract talk about as far as commitment? Can you clarify so your commitment by the tutor or by the contract? I'll by sorry. the contract. Oh, I mean. Well, I can share the contract um, is a piggyback, so it only goes until the end of next school year. So right now our commitment would be just for the spring. Um, you know, just because we agree to the contract doesn't mean we have to spend all the money that we use on that contract. So that was our understanding that we would only do it this spring and then um, make decisions on what schools we would continue to use it for for next school year. Or not continue to use. So or not continue okay. to use. <laughs> so so right now it's a short term implementation window just spring to the end of this current school year. Yes, okay. that's that's our I understanding. Think, Michelle, did you I want think to it goes to June anything? of 2025? The contract does, but yeah. we're gonna start with Correct. these few schools just for this spring. Correct. Right. So if the data or the whether it's qualitative or quantitative is not positive after this spring implementation, we are not obligated to continue the partnership with TutorFly, even though we have the spending authority within the contract to go to June 2025. Correct. That's okay. correct. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I'm just looking at my notes, I think. Okay. Um, any other Questions, Ms. Tolesky, Ms. She's got a little Ms. Booker Dwyer. What does <laughs> what's the half? I mean, I just I feel like if so many of our kids need tutoring, then there's a problem with instruction. And that's the root cause that needs to be addressed. We're putting a band-aid right. on something that needs a, and I would much we, rather invest into something else than to keep with these this tutoring because tutoring ain't it for Baltimore County right now, not for all students. We have to get to the instructional strategies so we we keep maxing our bandwidth because it's too many students that need it so we have to go back to the root cause and address that this isn't addressing that and i don't know and and i get tutoring is a high it's a it's, it is a high impact strategy but you got to have the right tutors they need to be trained there's a whole thing that goes behind making that strategy effective and i'm just not convinced that with this uh, that with this company that, that, I mean, do we have any data from any other schools that have used them that saw dramatic increases? Like, I just, there's so many questions I still have about TutorFly. I so, just want to speak to the investment in the professional learning, and specifically in our most vulnerable CSI and ATSI schools. We have invested a significant portion of school improvement grant funding to building capacity and not just through vendors, but through um, BCPS staff who are working shoulder to shoulder in those schools, constantly co-planning, modeling, co-teaching with those staff, in addition to some really great things we have coming ahead in the summer. So um, I just wanted to make sure that I put out there this, this is a multi-step approach. This is one piece of a bigger plan that is really extensive and comprehensive. So Ms. Booker Dwyer, I don't think anybody on the call will disagree that the first instruction needs to be the best instruction and the high quality instruction, which is why we're, you know, working on professional development for our own teachers. For the ATSI and CSI schools, there are, you know, content specialists who are working, as Ms. Stansbury just shared, working in the schools with teachers on rotating cycles to also build the capacity of the leadership teams there and their resource staff to provide that ongoing support. Um, so we absolutely agree that our most effective pathway is high quality first instruction that responds to the needs of the vast majority of students. 
However, while we're continuing to improve that, we don't want to do nothing for the students who already have gaps. So we have to try to do something to address the gaps that are already there at the same time as trying to prevent the gaps and fill them in within the classroom setting. So I think we're trying to do both at the same time, not at all withstanding that the focus is 100% on high quality, effective, meaningful, responsive, first instruction in math for every single student. Um, so I, I did, we do agree with you. 100%. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> 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 this is more awkward than a dinner party where nobody wants to talk. OK, ready? Do do I have a motion to approve the tutor fly contract? So move Stolesky. Do I have a second? <laughs> Am I allowed to second? <laughs> I mean, if I vote, sure, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think I am. Well, first, Miss. Booker Dwyer's second just gets a vote, so I don't know. If you want to make a second, if you don't, say you but don't. Without a second, it. there's no vote. Correct. The question is, can I make, <laughs> where, where's my Robert? Can I make the second? But I think we're going to need at least two out of the, oh, okay. Um, so let me ask you a question, Ms. Booker Dwyer. Does the idea of that short implementation mean anything to you or that's still? No, okay. I just, it, but we, are there other things we could do? Could we provide more support to teachers? Could we pay them to do anything like it? I'm just wondering, is there something else we could do? Because I just, or could we get more information about TutorFly and their their effectiveness levels? Who specifically the 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 background of the people who will be going out into these schools? Like, could we get some more information about that? Um, can I? So, is you know, part of me thinks is it it's not an or like we can't just focus on the tutoring. We have to focus on the effective first instruction. But in the meantime, we do have large numbers of kids who are who are struggling. Um, if I asked for a motion to postpone the approval of this contract until more information and data about TutorFly is presented, would I have a motion for that? Except oh, we never got a second, so there's nothing hanging on the floor. Okay. So do you have to say that that motion fails because it doesn't have a second? Look, I'm like yeah. online trying to read Robert's rules at the same okay. time. Yeah, then. Okay. okay. And I think even with the second, all three of us would have to approve it. Right. So the, the motion on the floor does not have a second. So there I said the official end of that one. Um, so do I have a motion to bring TutorFly back to the committee with more information about the company and results um, from other um, school systems, jurisdictions, partners, whatever they're doing? Can can you type the motion into the chat so that way I can capture it correctly for uh, sure? Um, let me get there. Um, and while she types, can I ask a question? Uh huh. So if we postpone the vote. Um, does it affect anything with the contract or do we have that time to do that? So we're going, we're supposed to be going to the contracts committee on um, the 4th. So yes, that would have to be pushed. I'm assuming we wouldn't be able to bring it to contracts committee without your approval. Would people well, agree? Is I that March 4th? Right, we have to do it at the March. When is I have to look, Miss Cox? When is our next meeting, curriculum committee meeting? Um, April fourth. Not till April fourth. Okay, that's no, a long. Time. There's one on March fourth. No, um, she's saying the contracts committee. Contracts committee. Janie's asking when the next curriculum committee. Curriculum meeting committee. Is. Right. Uh, if they push so, it. So what I was going to offer is, doesn't it still go to the contracts committee just without a recommendation from curriculum committee? 
It will, I think. I mean, it can, but you're going to tell them that you don't have the recommendation of the curriculum committee. I didn't know if we could pull it from the like. I'm I'm just asking about the process. I'm not recommending that. <laughs> oh, just, we, we are going to have to pull it anyway because we'd have to edit it, saying that it was well. Because I think the, the contract draft says something like it was reviewed Discussed. at the curriculum okay. committee. Yeah. yeah, on this date. Um, I'm, so there a, I'm sorry. Is there a date or deadline that? Um, BCPS has to communicate to Tutorfly that they're accepting the contract, and then we no, can... no. But what will happen is so it, if we put this is our understanding from Melanie's explanation, Melanie Webster's explanation to us, right? It typically takes about a month after the contract is approved. So if we're going to push it another month, and then we still can't start for another month, you know, I, I'm just not sure if it's even worth. Right. It, you know, because then we won't have enough time to see if it worked or not, because we're getting really close to the end of the school year. So others can chime in on that, how we feel about all that. So I believe, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ms. Stansberry. I was just agreeing that um, when we're getting into the testing window time of year, which is May, um, it may be more challenging, so. Does anybody see the motion I typed? Because I don't see it up there. Did I, I see it? Oh, OK. Oh, it's in the chat. I don't see the chat. OK. And I don't see anything in the chat either, but Ms. Yeah. Cox, it's up to it? Ms. Cox if she can see it. I can I see it. <laughs> I see it. Oh. OK, I don't even see it and I typed it, so I don't know what's happening. But but if somebody sees it, then then we're good. Ms. Cox, if you can see it, can you please read it? It says motion to bring the two to fly contract back to the curriculum committee with additional information concerning the company and results with co current and previous partners. Do I have a motion for that? Oh, Do I, I have yeah, a motion for that amendment. So moves to Lesky. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay, may I have a roll call vote on that motion? <laughs> um, Book of Dwyer? Yes. Stolowski? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Um, and I realize that our next meeting is not for over a month. Our next curriculum committee is not for a month. So if we feel that um, we need another meeting sooner than that to go over the information, we can we can look into adding another another meeting sooner. So Ms. Dr. DiDonato, you can decide about that and then we can follow up. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll have to find out when the next contracts committee. We just want it to be before the next contracts committee meeting. Well, the, that would be right before the next contracts comes to the probably the first April board meeting would be when that would okay. come up. Um, okay. So the last item on the agenda is the um, update on the A ELA and the secondary curriculum, and we only. We could not cut that conversation short, so I realized we were we were going over, but I didn't think we should cut it short. So we only have about 12 minutes for that presentation, which I know is going to take more than 12 minutes. So, Dr. Donato, would you like to try just one of them, or um, and I? And well, we I we did elementary. We got already, through so elementary. We, yeah, yeah right. we got through elementary okay. during the last meeting, so right. this will be the drive through of secondary um, updates. Okay. Um, okay. And, Let's start. OK. So to save time, I can I certainly we could just refer to certain slides since we sent it recorded and we could just jump into questions if that would so that people can ask a few questions. We could do it that way. Yeah, I think we've looked at the slides twice now, so are my Board of Ed members OK with skipping the questions? Yes. OK, then who would like to start with questions? Ms. Stolowski, do you have any questions? I'd have to reread okay. some of the slides because I All looked right. at it at the last meeting and I didn't um, review them. That's fine. Um, do you want to start with questions, Ms. Booker Dwyer? Or do you want me to start with questions? I didn't have a lot of questions because this okay. was just on the secondary piece. Right? That's correct. And so, so no, I okay. actually don't have a lot of questions for this one. So you, can, okay, <laughs> we can make up some time. Okay, so question I have is I know that you had um, 
visits to some of the field. I want to make sure I get the terminology right. This is a field test, right? Correct. Right. So yeah, I know that you had um, beginning of February visits to those schools. Um, do you have any anecdotal information about how the visits went and what you were seeing as far as strengths and needs? Yeah, so we only have two visits left at this point. One was because it was a semester high school and one was due to uh, some of the inclement weather. Um, so at this point, what we've been able to do is um, see it in action and except for the two that are coming up in all of the, the field test sites. Um, and so what we have started to see is um, some mixed um, feedback. And so there are some people that are really loving the program, um, the structure that it provides, the resources it provides um, and then we have some people that um, um, want more flexibility than uh, what a high quality instructional material provides. Um, another piece of feedback that we got pretty consistently was while there are multilingual learner supports um, that they don't seem robust enough. So like they're labeled and they're there, but then when you dig into them, they don't always help scaffold in, in a way that would help everyone access um, material at grade level. Um, and so um, we've taken all of that uh, feedback back and are doing some additional research around uh, what that means, because certainly we want to ensure that whatever curriculum we move forward will have the supports necessary for students and for teachers to feel successful with various student uh, populations, um, ensuring that we are making a very um, important choice using information that are gathered from people that are implementing it in our district. I was just going to add that. Um... One of the other things that I think has become apparent that Dr. Kraft and Ms. Wicks and I have talked with some of the secondary EDs of schools um, is around implementation, and, and Dr. Kraft referenced this, of any um, evidence-based curriculum at the secondary level. So there is a difference in the way teachers in elementary um, take on an evidence-based curriculum versus secondary teachers who have a degree in that content. And we have experienced that in our rollout in the math with the difference mm -hmm. between implementing bridges and implementing in, um, illustrative math. Um, it's just a difference in the way secondary educators are trained. It's a difference in the way they approach curriculum. And so some of the feedback that we've been discussing as we meet with teachers is really product agnostic, if you will, and really is about what does it mean to be a secondary teacher and adopt any high quality instructional material, which is, as you know, a big push in blueprint and a shift in the state. And so some of the feedback, as um, Dr. Kraft was referencing, um, is about helping our secondary teachers understand what does it mean to teach with um, integrity in a curriculum? Where do you have that opportunity to, to make those differences? Some of our secondary ELA teachers became ELA teachers because they love teaching literature. Yes. And so then when you make that shift around um, teaching students using um, an evidence based curriculum, that's something that we've uncovered. So that's not necessarily specific to HMH, but it is really important feedback that we're getting in this field test because it tells us work we need to do with teachers and teacher leaders before adopting anything so that we're really emphasizing what does that actually look like in a secondary classroom um, and, and how should we be um, priming the pump for that, if you will, and working with our leaders and our teacher and teacher leaders. So that's been very interesting in talking with on some of the visits um, is that some of what comes up is not necessarily specific to HMH into literature, but is to the idea of having an evidence based curriculum at all and what that looks like in a secondary classroom. And so as a result of that, we've talked a lot about what does that mean um, in terms of priming the pump? So before we put an evidence based curriculum in place, um, what are the things that we need to do? What's the roadmap um, to ensure that when we do purchase, when we do finally select and um, 
and to bring to the board uh, the one that we think will be the most viable um, that will increase student results, then how do we know then it will be implemented in a way that will get the results? And so part of that is, is the, and this is why a field test is so good, because we're starting to see where are some of the barriers. The other thing is we also know in addition to high quality instructional materials, it has to be accompanied by high quality professional learning. And so it will be the both of those together um, that will help us when we get to implementation phase. And so um, that is some of the work that we're doing, and that's why those visits um, were so important is to start to uh, uncover what is working and what it has been a challenge. Thank you for that. And then I know you have six middle schools and two-ish plus um, high schools. Are there full departments that are implementing it or sometimes just a singleton or two teachers? So um, it's a great question. So the way that our grades six and nine um, work um, is we actually have um, student service learning hours attached to the curriculum that we've taken through the process. So because this was a field test, we did exclude those two grade levels. So in middle school, we're doing grades seven and eight, and in high school, we're doing 10 and 11 because we also don't want to mess with any seniors that are getting ready to graduate. So we said we're just going to do these four grades. Um, um, there is nobody that's doing it as a singleton, though, to answer your question. So we wanted to at least the team has to do it. So they have to you know, decide. But we also coupled that with that it had to be voluntary, that they wanted to participate in it, because that's really how you get your most um, informative feedback is for, by people that have volunteered to do it. So um, we did a both and approach um, where people could opt in, but we also said don't leave somebody by themselves. We have also like on February 9th, we created um, an opera. We had some professional learning and um, then the the for the first two hours and then the last hour was um, allowing them to get into grade level groups. So we had four sections um, where we allowed all of the people that are field testing sixth grade, all the people that are te field testing seventh grade. So they were able Able to cross school collaborate with each other. So how many teachers in total are implementing? Um, um, let me just double check my notes. I don't I might have to send that to you later. I don't know that I okay. have a total number for you because I had actually the schools. I will okay. I will uh, send that to you as a follow up. OK, it just it feels like a low number of teachers that are field testing this. To make such a big decision um, later yeah, on. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I, I agree. I would have liked to have seen more participation. And what was really interesting, if you know, when you listen to the presentation, we had almost 180 um, teachers that previewed it. Um, and then 70% of those teachers said, I would be interested in participating. But then you know, there's a difference than when you really then put the opportunity in front of people. So um, I think that's something that we will continue to look at as we continue to um, have pilot implementations to gather feedback. What is our number of uh, ideally of teachers and grade levels that we're looking at in schools so that we're making the most informed decision possible? Is the goal to have a vote on this this in school year? So Ms. Lichter, to your point, um, we do recognize that this was a very small um, field test with not as robust a number of, of participants as we would like to have, and we are really evaluating that before we bring forward any recommendation um, because we do understand that you know to truly evaluate something, we have to have enough students in something to evaluate progress. And, and the implementation of it. So we are taking that very seriously in any next step that we make. Okay, thank you. Okay, with I do three minutes, one, go one ahead. Question. Uh, with the initial teacher feedback, it, could we see the full feedback responses and have weightings on uh, these responses? So for instance, uh, you know, it was it just, was it the same teacher that said about these early shared successes and then all the other teachers had challenges or <laughs> vice versa? Or like what it, it will be, it's helpful to put a, a in like how many teachers, how many, you know, I get these are direct quotes from one teacher, but how many teachers had similar challenges? How many yeah. teachers had similar successes? 
So I absolutely can share the survey result data with you. We do not have to anonymize the data because we wanted to make sure that it was as uh, that people felt comfortable filling it out. We don't have it associated with names, but we certainly can get you an N in terms of, of you know, uh, the number of teachers that filled it out. And but we just can't cross reference locate, you know, locations and teachers. That's fine. Even if there's an N so that we can get an idea where the trends are uh, yes. before we make a decision on this curriculum. Absolute. Oh, yes. OK, any further questions? Right now, I know this will come back to us. So, um, yeah, this was just to provide an update of where we update. were, and and not right. asking for any type of decision. No. So I will. <laughs> I will not ask for any type of motion for this one. Um, <laughs> no okay. motion. It was purely informational. Purely. But this is helpful. That. But this is also helpful to hear initial questions and things yeah. that you're asking about, so that you know when we come back to even give another update we can provide, you know, even more thorough information that's really responsive to the questions that you are asking. OK. All right, thank you. Our next curriculum committee meeting right now is scheduled for April 4th, 2024, and we can look at whether we need um, one before that. Is there any further business from anyone? I just have one very quick comment. Yes. Um, I was lucky enough last week to visit Owings Mills Elementary for HMH and math. And the students were all really engaged. Um, the climate and the environment was just uplifting. So many positive, wonderful things were happening. That's so wonderful. So I just wanted to share that little sparkle Yay. of amazing news. What a great optimistic closure. That's yeah. awesome. Yes. Yeah. And, and I can echo when I went to the schools in January, I saw lots of reading and writing. So, um, and, you know, kids with, books in their hands, annotating right on it. So um, yes, so thank you, Ms. And just Celeste, to add on that. to what you, you just said about the reading oh. and writing, one of the conversations that we had was that scaling back the devices and bringing a better balance of um, traditional learning, reading and writing, as Ms. Lichter said, and reducing the device usage, I think has had a really positive impact. And on that note, there is no further business. So I will say that this meeting is adjourned. Thank you everybody for participating and answering our couple of questions that we may have <laughs> <laughs> that we may have had. And thanks, Ms. Cox, for helping me organize it. Sure. Have a nice night and I'll see you guys tomorrow. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Have a good evening.